Welcome to Bible class this evening. Tonight we're going to be looking at the life of the man that invented some of the most memorable English phrases that are found in the Bible, such as, let there be light, twinkling of an eye, lead us not into temptation, signs of the times, the salt of the earth, fight the good fight, a law unto themselves. William Tyndale was the one that gave us these phrases as he translated the original languages of Hebrew and Greek of the Bible into the English language. He was the man who can be called the heroic father of the English Bible. Now let's come before the Lord in prayer. Our loving God and most holy Father, we come before thee this evening thankful for this great man and we pray as we think about his life, as we see how the scriptures so touched him and moved and shaped his life, uh, even to the point where he gave his life for the gospel. Lord, we pray, please touch our hearts too. Show us uh, where in our life we need to take to heart the scriptures more and to love the Bible and that its truths may work out in our lives for thy glory. So, Lord, do use this message tonight and bless us each and help us, we pray, for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, William Tyndale then, uh, he loved the scriptures, and so I'm going to read from Psalm 119 and verse 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, William Tyndale was born in Gloucestershire, around the year 1494, and he was educated at Madeline Hall, Oxford, in 1505 to 1516, and then he moved to Cambridge in 1516 to 1522. He was ordained into the priesthood in 1514, and he was born into a fairly wealthy family of yeoman fathers, uh, sorry, yeoman farmers or merchants about the borders of Wales. And the Tyndales had lived in Gloucestershire for many generations, though the name suggests that their origins may have been in the north of England. A Tyndale family lived at Stinchcombe in a house called Melksham Court, and it's presumed to be the place that Tyndale was born. The church at North Nibley is thought to be where he was baptised and there's a monument to Tyndale that was erected in 1866 that stands on Nibley Knoll with its view over the Severn Valley. So Tyndale was born at a time when the Latin Vulgate, that was the translation of the Bible from uh, the original languages, as I say, Hebrew and Greek, uh, by the church father in the 5th century, Jerome. He translated the Latin Vulgate. And that was the only Bible at Tyndale's time, all these years later, uh, that was available beside the original tongues. Well, the vast majority of people, of course, didn't know Latin in this country. It was a, a dead language. It was only ever heard in, in a church. Can we imagine going to a, a church and only hearing a language that we didn't understand? That was the world into which Tyndale was born and grew up. Fifty years before, there was a German called Johann Gutenberg, and he had invented 
the printing press. This was a seminal moment in European history. Uh, finally, people could publish books and have them printed at reasonable cost and distributed, and people would then be able to read in their own language. Well, in 1455, the Latin Gutenberg Bible was published because very few people owned a copy of the scriptures. It was only chained to uh, the altar in, in the churches often. And they had to go there to read the scriptures. Now the printing press was invented and this Latin Gutenberg Bible was published. And then in 1466, the first German Mentel Bible was printed. William Caxton, of course, revolutionized the availability of books by bringing the first printing press to England in 1476, and he published Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Well, Tyndale loved to read, especially history, and he recorded his inspiration uh, when he discovered King Alfred, who just before the year 900 had the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Ten Commandments, and the Psalms, translated into Old English for his people. So King Alfred really led the way in England in the year 900. He must have known of the early translation efforts, uh, Tyndale, of John Wycliffe. You remember that Wycliffe uh, who lived the previous century, uh, had many preachers. They were called lollards, which means mutterers. That was a, a term that was ascribed to them by Wycliffe's enemies. These preachers go about muttering and preaching about uh, these doctrines that they held dear. Well, Wycliffe then, he uh, began his translation of the Bible into English, but it was still quite uh, an obscure effort. But there was a man called John Purvey, who lived in 1354 to 1421. He had done much to revise Wycliffe's translation from the Latin Vulgate. So there were early efforts to have an English Bible that people could read for themselves. Well, Tyndale was struck. He found it so painful to see how low and how superstitious the spiritual life of the people in this country was. Each priest did what was right in his own eyes, and superstitions surrounded relics, and there was, of course, the culthood of saints uh, that abounded in the country. Preaching was almost non-existent. And in the universities, Tyndale observed that uh, the students were, as he called it, nozzled in all kinds of theories and philosophies of heathen learning, as he called it, for eight or nine years before students even heard a word of scripture read. So there was a general decline and much superstition. The spiritual state of this country was very low at the time. Well, there had been a man 10 years or so before Tyndale uh, who was called John Collett. And he preached in London from the epistles of Paul. He was the dean of St. Paul's Cathedral. And he expounded directly from the Greek text. And his expositions were uh, very sound and very good. But Tyndale didn't seem to have come across uh, John Collett. When Tyndale arrived at Madeline Hall in Oxford around 1505, it was 
a very pivotal moment in European history because the medieval thought which had dominated the thinking of people for so many centuries was being overtaken by what was called the new learning and the Reformation doctrines. Tyndale, he had already got a deep love of scripture and his great motive was to turn the book of books into a living word for the general public. He was a diligent scholar and yet a true Christian man endeavouring to bring others to Christ through his sincere expositions of scripture to his friends in private. Already the word of God was to be the true test of life and conduct for Tyndale. He was meticulous in applying the scriptures to his daily life, questioning himself and seeking to serve the Lord from the heart. You see, the scripture he found gave him liberty. It freed him from all the superstitions and priestcraft uh, that he had grown up with. And his spirit was so stirred with the scriptures. When he read the scriptures, he was, uh, as it were, so delighted to have the word of God and to keep it. He was called a man of most virtuous disposition. He had a character which was godly and he loved to live for the Lord. You see, this was the secret of Tyndale's life. His heart was devoted to Christ and he sought daily to walk in the light of the truth of the word of God. Well, he came then to Oxford and then perhaps around the time that Oxford was gripped with bouts of violence and bigotry against the Reformation teachings, that he left Oxford around 1516 and went to Cambridge, where John Fox, in his famous Fox's Book of Martyrs, said he was further ripened in the knowledge of God's word. Here he had no doubt found godly companions. You remember when we looked at the study of Thomas Bilney, that there was a certain White Horse Inn in Cambridge where many of these early reformers uh, went to discuss things. And no doubt Tyndale joined them on occasion and shared his excitement at the fact that Erasmus had published his Novum Testamentum, which was the New Testament in Greek with the Latin written alongside it. So there was a time, it was a time of excitement and uh, interest in the scriptures. Erasmus himself had been teaching at Cambridge and maybe the memory of that and the discussion that would follow no doubt afterwards among, uh, with him and among his friends uh, would have continued for some time there in Cambridge in the White Horse Inn. It was also at Cambridge that Tyndale met a man called John Frith. He was a scholar who had come from Eton College and he was converted by Tyndale's testimony of the word of God. And he became a great supporter of Tyndale for the rest of Tyndale's life. Well, in 1521 or two, Tyndale left Cambridge probably because the Bishop of Rochester, John Fisher, who was a great Catholic theologian at the time, had preached a sermon entitled Against the Pernicious Doctrine of Martin Luther. And he'd come and preach this sermon. And so it was a time that uh, Tyndale decided to return to Gloucestershire, to his beloved Cotswold, Cotswold and to become a tutor in, a, in the house of a man called Sir John Walsh. 
who lived at Little Sodbury Manor. And in the relative tranquility of being a tutor for the children of Sir John, uh, Tyndale was able to find much time to read in his room. He had a mastery by this time of French and Greek and Hebrew and German, Italian, Spanish, Latin, and of course English. And this demonstrates he had such a brilliant aptitude for intense study. Now, people would visit Little Sodbury Manor. Uh, Deans and abbots and archbishops would come and they would enjoy the hospitality of the Walshes. And often around the dinner table, Tyndale would join them. And sometimes questions would be raised concerning doctrines and the scriptures. Tyndale always spoke out boldly for what he believed was right. Now, how did he speak out? He did not give his own opinions. His habit was to always quote scripture directly. And so there was nowhere for these opponents of Reformation teaching to go because Tyndale said, well, that is the scripture. That is what is written in the word of God. And so they disliked him. Well, Tyndale, he kept the favor of Sir John, Lady Walsh, all his life, and he commenced his preaching labors in the open air among the hamlets. And also around 15 miles away in Bristol, he would go and preach the gospel. Uh, he would preach on College Green in front of the Augustinian convent, and he boldly would challenge the priests and the friars. But he was accused then of heresy, and so the die was cast. And though he was acquitted of that heresy, he remained a free man for a time, when later he would be brought to court and acquitted, he could go uh, for a time as a free man. Well, after some serious reflection, he concluded the only thing that would open the eyes of the public in this country was the plain word of God. This is what he said. I perceived by experience how that it was impossible to establish the lay people in any truth except the scriptures were plainly laid before their eyes in their mother tongue. So Wycliffe, he had used, you remember those years before, the Latin Vulgate. But Tyndale would go to, directly to the sources through Erasmus's Greek text. Unknown to Tyndale, Luther himself had already commenced his own German translation using the same uh, text of Erasmus. The final straw for Tyndale before he set out on this task seemed to be a dispute with a man who affirmed that men would be better without the laws of God than without the laws of the Pope. Now probably borrowing from Erasmus's hope that he expressed in the preface of his Novus Instrumentum that a farmer, as he followed the plough, might cheer himself with the songs of Scripture, Tyndale made a vow. And this is his famous vow. He said, I defy the Pope and all his laws, if God spare my life, ere many years I will cause a boy that driveth a plough, and they shall know more of the Scripture than thou doest. As he was answering in reply to one of his opponents. Well, under the Constitution of Oxford in 1408, it was forbidden on penalty of death to translate the Bible into English without the permission of a bishop. So in July 1523, Tyndale left Little Sodbury Manor and went to London. He spent a year largely endeavouring to get the Bishop of London to act as his patron uh, while he would translate the Bible into English. Cuthbert Tungstall was the Bishop of, Lon uh, of London at that time and he 
firmly rejected Tyndale's pleas. That came to Tyndale such a bitter blow because exile now loomed. In a sense, his cover was blown. He couldn't hide his desire to translate the scriptures and now he was under the gaze of the Bishop of London who was opposed to him. But he had a friend, a friend in a man called Humphrey Monmouth, a merchant who had heard Tyndale preach in Bristol. And with this support, Tyndale secured Luther's books and avidly read them. And now he was certain of his destiny. And so he set sail for Hamburg in Germany in May 1524. Arriving in Hamburg, Tyndale visited Luther in Saxony, spent nine or ten months in Wittenberg, and within a year he translated the New Testament using Erasmus's latest edition, the 1522 edition of the Greek, and in the spring of 1525 he returned back to Hamburg and then pressed on to Cologne where printing presses were more readily available. And of course Cologne had trade connections with England. However, after the printing staff became drunk, they let out the secret as to what they were printing, and so uh, the city senate ordered the work to be stopped. So snatching his printed sheets, Tyndale fled to Worms via the Rhine, and there in the safety of that city uh, he stayed. And by the spring of 1526, 6,000 New Testaments were printed. These were smuggled through customs in London in bales of cloth, sacks of flour, and other goods cartons. And finally, the light of the truth of the word of God that had been hidden uh, behind all of the superstitions of Rome began to dawn in this land. In October 1526, the Bishop of London heard of these New Testaments and he ordered that within 30 days all copies should be burned. But despite many burnings, 3,000 pirate copies had been printed in Antwerp. Many of those reach London. Now, many Lutherans were arrested and the prisons were swollen with their numbers And John Frith himself was detained, but later fled and found Tyndale and told him everything that had happened. So Tyndale moved to Antwerp in early 1528 so that he could organize the transport of the books to England. And here he published other books, including his Parable of Wicked Manor, which was a expounding of the doctrine of the of justification by faith, and another book called The Obedience of the Christian Man. So it was this book that left a marked effect on the readers. And this was the the book which Anne Boleyn, the wife of Henry VIII, uh, was introduced to, and she passed it on to Henry. And it was said of him after reading it, now he doth wholly reign, not as half as before, sorry, not half as before. In other words, it encouraged Henry in his desire to break from Rome and all uh, that would follow. Well, no doubt it had some influence for good upon Henry VIII then, and it led most likely to the fall from grace of Cardinal Wolsey, Uh, following his failure to secure the Pope's agreement to Henry's divorce. Well, 1527 arrived and Tyndale started his translation of the Old Testament from the Hebrew. And by uh, by 1528, he completed the first draft of the Old Testament. But news came that was not good. Others were hunting for him. A court warrant came to his ears. And in early 1529, he sailed from Antwerp up the coast of Holland, but was shipwrecked, losing his precious books and writings and all his money. And he would have to start his translation again. 
And so he finally arrived by another ship to Hamburg. And there he met with his old Cambridge connection, Miles Coverdale. Coverdale was at his side and he retranslated the Pentateuch and returned to Antwerp when the danger had subsided in the last part of 1529. So by early 1530, the Pentateuch was published. Six copies survive apparently today and it included new words like Passover and mercy seat. And so Wolsey at this time had been sacked by Henry VIII and died at Leicester Abbey after his arrest as he journeyed to the Tower of London. And Sir Thomas More, the replacement Lord Chancellor, was similarly opposed to the Reformation. So in Henry, sorry, in 1531, Henry VIII had agreed to Thomas Cromwell's plan to win over Tyndale by using a merchant at Antwerp called Stephen Vaughan. Tyndale didn't believe the promise of safe passage, but instead pleaded that Henry VIII would allow the plain scripture to be published. Henry reacted by ordering Tyndale's kidnap. But the ambassador returned without success. John Frith was captured on a visit to England and put into the tower, and Tyndale wrote to him affectionately counselling, if your pains prove to be above your strength, pray to your father in the name, and he will ease it. Well, the last days then of Tyndale. 1534, Tyndale found lodging in the English house at Antwerp. And under the shadow of a distant relative of Lady Walsh, he stayed and continued his labours and brought out a revised New Testament in 1534, which soon sold out. A third edition was published in 1535. Tyndale expressed the one desire of his heart as follows. I bow the knees of my heart unto God night and day that he will show it all, he will show it all other men and I suffer all that I can to be a servant to open their eyes. Also my part be not in Christ if mine heart be not to follow and live according as I teach and also if mine heart weep not uh, weep not night and day for mine own sin and other men's indifferent beseeching of God to convert us all and to take his wrath from us and to be merciful as well as to other men as to mine own soul caring for the wealth of the realm I was born in for the king and all that are thereof as a tender-hearted mother would do for her only son. Such a heart that Tyndale had. Well, finally, a plot against Tyndale would succeed. The Englishman, Henry Phillips, who on arrival at Antwerp, he was an extreme Catholic who'd fled from his father after robbing him. He found Tyndale and he schemed some kind of friendship with Tyndale and became a dinner guest. And at length he managed to lure Tyndale from the safety of the English house there in Antwerp and betrayed him to the imperial officers. And Tyndale found himself arrested on the 23rd or 24th of May in 1535. And he was imprisoned in Vilvorde Castle. There he languished, long months passed. Well, the private trail, trial proceeded. He had no books, no friends, and no news. And he was in the valley of the shadow of death. Fox says such was the power of his testimony that he converted his keeper, his keeper's daughter, and others in the household, while all in the castle spoke of him as a good Christian man. The trial then reached its climax in August 1536 and Tyndale was condemned as a heretic, stripped from the Roman Catholic priesthood and handed over to the secular authorities for punishment. And in fr on Friday the 6th of October, he was led to the stake 
and bound with a chain around his waist and bundles of sticks placed at his feet. And he was strangled and a fire was lit. And after he had cried with great force, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. He sealed his testimony with his own lifeblood. This then was the life of William Tyndale. Very brief overview for us this evening. We're drawn from the book called Masters of the English Reformation, which I'd recommend to you, written by a man called Marcus Lone for this evening's study. Well, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Our gracious God, how we come before thee with thankful hearts for this Bible in English. We read it, we have Uh, the light of its truth concerning Christ and the gospel in our own language. Its doctrines are not in secret any longer. Uh, We are not beholden to superstitions. We thank thee so much for such a liberty to open up this scripture, these scriptures, and to find Christ and the gospel there. We thank thee then tonight for the life of William Tyndale, and we pray for his heart, his burden in our own day to cause many in our land and across the earth to be able to read and understand the blessed message of hope, forgiveness of sins, new life and heaven through the life and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we come. Amen.